Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the Lab 207 webcast. My name is Mr. Kite, and I'll be hanging out with you today as we continue on in our series about ecology. Now, can't believe it, but 118 videos later, this is the last video for the AP Biology series. Um, it's been great hanging out with you all, and I thank you for all of the support and encouragement um, through comments and likes and views that you have uh, passed along throughout the last nine months that you've been checking out these videos. Um, I will be back next spring, or not next spring, but probably next fall, with a series on AP Environmental Science. So please keep sharing these videos with your friends and look for those environmental science videos to be coming out either in the summer or next fall. But I digress. Let me jump on in. We're talking about the changing earth today. Here are your objectives, as always. Just one thing that I need you to know or be able to do by the end of this video, and that is to describe specific human activities and their impact on the living world. Like I said, this is all about impact on the living world world. So first thing that I want you to understand is the planet that we currently inhabit is not your grandmother's planet. The world has changed significantly since the Industrial Revolution began in the 1850s. And through the rest of this video, I'm going to go through several specific things that humans are doing and how they're impacting the earth. But just recognize that probably even from the time that you were born, the planet that you live on is now significantly different environmentally, ecologically, etc. So spend the rest of, the, of our time talking about specific things that humans do and how they impact the earth. The first thing that I want to hit on is nutrient enrichment. Now, humans have gotten very good at taking nutrients from one place and shifting them to another place. This might be in the form of fertilizers or less obviously, it could be simple like cultivation of crops or deforestation. Um, if you deforest an area, a lot of the nutrient in that ecosystem would have been held in those trees that you've just cut down. So in deforesting an area and transporting those trees away, you've just taken a significant proportion of that ecosystem's nutrient and moved it to another place. Also with the application of fertilizers, you are taking nutrients that existed in one place and applying them to another place. Next slide has got more on fertilizers specifically. Um, another way to look at nutrient enrichment and shifting balances is there are some places like the American grasslands in the, mid in the Midwest when they were first used for cultivation or cultivated for agriculture. They were able to support crops without any support for quite a long time because they had very deep, rich soils that are just kind of the product of a temperate grassland. Now, conversely, if you deforest, let's say, a tropical rainforest, since most of the nutrition in a tropical rainforest is in the trees and not the soil, that soil is only going to be good for cultivation for a year or two. So the area that you choose to farm is going to have a big impact on how long it's going to be before you have to apply some nutrition to that soil. But if we're thinking about shifting the balance of nutrition, there's other ways you could look at it. If you grow food in California and ship it to North Carolina for consumption, that is a shifting of nutrition from one place to another. And that, I mean, relatively speaking, is a short shift. A lot of our food has traveled up from South America or over from Europe or China. So all of that would be examples of taking nutrients that normally would have stayed in one place and moving them to another place. Now, specifically speaking, let's spend a second talking about nitrogen. Nitrogen is the darling of farmers and the bane of fishermen. Here's why. Um, with the Green Revolution, Norman Borlaug in the 40s to the 70s figured out how to use nitrogen as a fertilizer. And the thing is, plants love nitrogen. In terrestrial ecosystems, nitrogen is a limiting factor. So applying a lot of nitrogen to the soil causes plants to grow up very rapidly. So excellent, great for farmers, can support a lot of people. Problem is, nitrogen applied as fertilizer can easily leach into water supplies, whether it be running off into a stream or a lake or leaching into groundwater. Um, when nitrogen concentrations become too high in water, it can become unsafe for human consumption. It can kill off organisms that are living in that water. An example of this is in the spring and the summer each year, um, runoff in Mississippi, in the Mississippi River in America increases dramatically. And as that's happening, as rains are falling in the spring, all of the farms that are along the Mississippi that have applied nitrogen-containing fertilizers have that fertilizer runoff into the Mississippi. 
Mississippi then carries all that fertilizer accumulated from running through six or seven states, dumps it into the Gulf of Mexico where a dead zone is created, which is an area that is very, very low in oxygen. And basically what happens is when the nitrogen gets to nitrogen and phosphorus, when they get to the Gulf of Mexico, they cause a rapid bloom in algae. Those algae die and the organisms that consume those algae take oxygen out of the water and all of the fish and stuff move out of the area, which... You know, a lot of the ocean waters that this happens to is also America's most productive fishing water. So it's a problem. Great for farmers who are trying to grow crops, but when that nitrogen runs off into the Gulf of Mexico, it kills off the fishing industry. So a lot of farmers are becoming more efficient with their application of nitrogen, but it's still a significant problem. Next problem I want to talk about is toxins. Now, Toxins are things that humans have created that may not have previously existed in the environment. Some of them break down very rapidly in the environment. Some of them are persistent, which means that they hang around for a long time. I want to use an example to illustrate the idea of bioaccumulation. Um, DDT was found to be a very, very effective um, insecticide, especially against mosquitoes. It was highly stable, lasted in the environment for a long time, and was very effective at killing mosquitoes. Problem is, um, experiments found that DDT was an endocrine disruptor, or could act as an endocrine disruptor, which means that it is rough on the endocrine system. And they also found that it decreases the ability of birds to form very good shells. And the way they kind of learned this is through eagles and birds of prey, their populations were rapidly declining because these birds had become contaminated with DDT. They were producing eggs that had shells that were too thin, then when they would sit on the shell to incubate it, it would break the shell of the egg. Now, the way that they became contaminated was through a process called bioaccumulation. I'm gonna draw you a little picture to illustrate it. Now, toxin gets into the environment. It's gonna work its way up the food chain, and here's essentially what happens. Let's say down on the bottom, you have got 10 little phytoplankton. Each of these little phytoplankton eat one molecule of DDT. So for them, it's not a big deal because each one of them has been contaminated with one molecule of DDT. Now, going up the food chain, you've got two primary consumers, and each of these primary consumers needs to eat five phytoplankton in order to stay alive. So where each of those phytoplankton got one molecule of DDT, each of these primary consumers has now gotten five molecules of DDT. And if we go up to this top level, this predator up here, let's say he has to eat two of these guys to stay alive. So he has just gotten 10 molecules of DDT. So bioaccumulation is the idea that as toxins move up the food chain, they become increasingly more concentrated. This is why those birds of prey were the ones that were most affected by the DDT because they were at the top of the food chain. So they were getting the most concentrated doses of the toxin. Now, 1971, the use of DDT was banned in America. Since then, bird of prey um, populations have increased dramatically. They've pretty much recovered. Problem is, there's a lot of debate about DDT in the developing world because it is a very effective pesticide at um, preventing malaria, killing off the mosquitoes that cause malaria, and it has been shown to be relatively non-toxic to humans. So a lot of people say, hey, we should use this. It saves people's lives. It kills mosquitoes that harbor malaria. Others say, we don't know what it's going to do to the environment. So as with so many other environmental topics, there is debate around the use of DDT around the world. Now let's talk about carbon dioxide concentration. Um, the graph there on the right is called the Keeling Curve. Um, it shows measurements made of atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration since 1958. And as you can see there, the line has gone upwards and it continues to go upwards. Now, good and bad consequences of this. One good consequence of a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere that isn't often talked about is more CO2 equals greater primary production. So if your plants have got a lot of CO2, they grow bigger. Bigger plants are great because they take more carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. One problem, other than global warming, which we'll talk about in a second, is ocean acidification. Um, CO2 in the atmosphere has the ability to dissolve into the ocean. As it dissolves into the ocean, it forms carbonic acid, which increases the acidity of the ocean, and that can be rough on coral reefs and other sensitive ecosystems. So while nobody really talks about good things of more CO2 in the atmosphere, you could look at plant growth, growth but on the flip side of that, you've also got ocean acidification. And then there's the big one that everybody talks about, and that is global warming. Now, 
We've got visible sunlight or sunlight sending all sorts of radiation into the earth every single day. A lot of that radiation is reflected, some is absorbed. Infrared radiation that is absorbed by the surface of the earth is re-radiated back out to space and the class of gases called greenhouse gases trap that heat and hold it in. Now, this is called the greenhouse effect, which on the surface is a great thing because our temperature or our earth would not be a livable temperature if we did not have the atmosphere and the greenhouse effect around us. Problem is, as CO2 is being added to the atmosphere, it is trapping more and more heat. As more heat is trapped, the globe is getting warmer, which is causing all sorts of changes. There's a slew of things I could give you. Storms are becoming more intense. Um, distribution of disease-causing organisms are shifting. You know, where you had malaria-causing mosquitoes that used to live along the equator, as the Earth gets warmer, their range is extending north and south. You have got more frequent rains and storms. You have got areas of the Earth becoming desertified. Um, you have got ice caps melting. All of those things are consequences of global warming. And, you know, ecosystems are very specific places with a set of conditions that's specific. So as the globe warms up, the composition and location of ecosystems is going to change. So <clears throat> lots of consequences. You hear them on the TV all the time. Just be aware that it is a real thing. It is data supported. It is happening. And it's now just a matter of wondering what can we do to deal with the consequences of global warming. And last topic I want to talk about today is the idea of ozone depletion. Now, ozone is a gas that hangs out in the stratosphere, O3. We like ozone because ozone protects us from a lot of the UV radiation that can cause cancer. It absorbs it and keeps it from getting it getting to us, which is fantastic. Now, there's a class of chemicals called ozone depleting chemicals, and they are gases that, when released into the atmosphere, break down the ozone molecule and disrupt its ability to absorb UV radiation. Um, the one that is most commonly known or most recognized is chlorofluorocarbons or CFCs. Um, this class of chemicals wreaks havoc upon ozone, and the ozone depletion has sh been shown to be the greatest around the South Pole, around Antarctica. Um, every spring and summer for them, a huge hole opens up in the ozone layer. You can see that picture there is a NASA graphing of ozone concentrations around the world. Blue and purple means there's not a whole lot. Green means that, you know, things are in pretty good shape. So as ozone is depleted, more UV radiation hits the earth, which for humans has consequences in the form of skin cancer, eye damage. Um, it really wrecks havoc on the uh, reproduction of amphibians, it jacks up their eggs because they're not really covered in shells. So not the best thing. Now, ozone depletion is something that humans are starting to get their hands on. Um, back in 1989, there was a meeting in Montreal that put out a statement essentially banning or greatly reducing the use of ozone depleting chemicals. Problem is ozone depleting chemicals are highly persistent, which means that they stay in the atmosphere for a long time. So it's possible that we won't see a significant rebound in ozone concentration for another 15 or 20 years. So that's it. That is human's impact on the environment. Sorry for the edit in the middle. The lights went out on me. And as always, thank you for joining us on the Lab 207 webcast. I've really enjoyed being able to help you out with your stuff over the last nine months. And I would really encourage you to join us when we come back in the fall with a whole new set on environmental science. So until then, thank you for joining us. My name is Mr. Kite, and we'll see you again.